Good afternoon, um, everyone. If you're in the in the Illinois in the Midwest or so, or good morning if you're elsewhere, or good evening. Um, thank you for joining our last uh, event of ICM Chicago and IEEE Computer Society Chicago uh, for 2023. So you know we've made it. So thank you very much for your uh, support. Um, today we're going to have a talk uh, from um, Jacob Gaburi. I'm talking about from teapots to Toy Story, a prehistory of computer graphics. Yes, yeah, so this um, talk here is uh, being hosted by um, ACM Chicago. So it's the Association for Computing uh, Machinery. Um, if you're familiar with ACM, ACM does a lot of uh, computing um, events, conferences. Um, if you're academic, there's ACM conferences. Um, a lot of also as well, um, there's lots of chapters around the world that do these competing um, events with webinars and, and seminars. Uh, so, um, you know, we are, we are pleased uh, to have ACM Chicago here. I'm the chair for ACM Chicago, um, Alvin Chin. And also as well, we also have our co-host, um, IEEE Computer Society uh, Chicago chapter. So IEEE stands for Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. And we've been partnering together with them uh, for these particular um, events now for I think the past maybe now three years or so. So um, it's been a really great collaboration. And so I'm also the chair for the Computer Society. Um, you can see here on the um, the, the first left here um, is uh, Mark Temkin. He's our vice chair for ACM Chicago. Uh, right after him is um, Greg Newmark, who is the treasurer for ACM Chicago, myself there, and then uh, Gina Martinez, who is the vice chair for Computer Society, IEEE uh, Chicago. Okay, so before um, I have uh, Mark to present our speaker for um, today, uh, just a bit of housekeeping rules. Um, so basically what we're gonna do here, this is being recorded, um, and then you will find a recording of that. Um, it will be on our YouTube um, channel. So if you haven't subscribed, we will, we will show that towards the end, what's our YouTube channel, that you can subscribe to get this particular presentation and other previous um, presentations. Um, also as well, if you have any questions for the speaker, um, please type them in the Q&A. And then we'll have time at the end or so to address those particular questions. Um, and then third as well, if you require a um, professional development hour um, certificate for professional engineering, um, that will also be provided at the end. You can um, email or you will be given the, uh, in your email, you will see the, the link where you can go ahead and download the certificate and then you can put your name on there. All right, so without further ado, then I will hand it over to uh, Mark to present our last speaker for this year. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to our presentation today. I'm really glad that we have this talk on computer history of uh, computer graphics. I think it's a, a great subject, and I think that when you consider what this is about, many of us wouldn't even be in front of our computers at this point if it was not for the developments in computer graphics, just what is done on a PC alone, as well as medicine, movies, games, and I think the applications go on and on. So I'm really glad we have our speaker, Jacob Gaburi, for his presentation on From Teapots to Toy Story. So today I'm going to... Uh talk through um, some material on the early history of computer graphics. I'm a computer historian by training. Um, I'm an associate professor in the Department of uh, Film and Media, actually, uh, at UC Berkeley. Um, and this is the book that I wrote in 2021 um, about the history of computer graphics. Um, and I'm going to be kind of pulling from some of that material uh, today and maybe referring to it. So um, I wanted you to see uh, and and know kind of where I was coming from. Um, I'm not sure what kind of uh, background people have in computer history. So, um, you know, hopefully some of this is uh, new and novel to uh, many of you. So I'm going to begin uh, as the book begins um, with sort of a moment um, in the fall of 1972 um, when a woman named Marcia Sutherland spent several weeks uh, driving around Salt Lake City, Utah, in a Volkswagen Beetle um, that was half covered in a polygon mesh, as you can see here. Um, the car was a sort of spectacle. Um, it's sort of green exterior uh, dotted with hundreds of numbered vertices connected to form a grid of irregular squares. 
Um, when I interviewed students who participated in this particular activity uh, in the early 1970s, um, they sort of recalled this extended period of time when Marsha Sutherland had to drive around the city um, with a car looking like this kind of like half digital, half physical, um, going to the bank, going grocery shopping, et cetera. Um, and so I find it a really evocative object in this particular moment in the history of computer graphics and computer science, um, precisely because it sort of splits the difference between the image and the object. Um, Marsha had moved to Salt Lake City um, from Cambridge, Massachusetts, just four years prior to that with her husband, Ivan Sutherland, who perhaps some of you are more familiar with. with. Um, Ivan had left Harvard uh, in 1968 for a tenured position in the computer science program uh, at the University of Utah. Um, and again, uh, each week, uh, Marsha would drive up the foothills of the Salt Lake Valley um, to the Merrill Engineering Building, which is still there today, um, where Ivan students would carefully sort of mark and measure the car for digitization. Um, and along the way, she, you know, would traverse a grid of a different sort, uh, this sort of lockstep raster of city blocks that make up what's known as the Plat of Zion, um, which is a plan for this uh, sort of city of God that was first developed by uh, Joseph Smith in 1833, and then later sort of dug out of the valley floor by uh, Brigham Young and his followers with the founding of Salt Lake City in 1847. Um, and by the end of that year, 1972, Marsha's Beetle would become uh, the first real world object to be fully scanned and rendered by a computer. So this is a sort of surprising object, I think, and in a kind of unlikely place, at least for most people. And again, what interests me about it is the way that it sort of straddles these two different worlds. Um, uh, the beetle, as I'm sure many of you know, was a global symbol of 1960s counterculture. Um, and so it was really almost ubiquitous in this period in the early 1970s. In fact, uh, a couple of years, or that same year rather, in 1972, um, in February, a few months prior, the beetle actually surpassed the Ford Model T to become the most widely manufactured vehicle ever produced, um, with its design pretty much unchanged since 1938, um, though it's since lost that title to the uh, Toyota Corolla, a much less interesting car, perhaps, um, but still. Um, and so I think this iconic status of the Beetle as a symbol of this era is kind of what drove uh, Ivan Sutherland's students to it and made it kind of legible as an object that they chose to be sort of this first thing that gets digitized. Um, and yet this particular Beetle um, also marks the beginning of a different kind of radical transformation in the shape of our lived environment, a kind of turning point uh, in which the physical world becomes saturated with digital objects. So um, we can think, uh, for example, of the building that we are currently sitting in, wherever you are, um, uh, the phone in your pocket, uh, the text that I'm currently reading, all of these objects have been materially shaped uh, by a process that we can trace back to, in some sense, Marcia Sutherland winding her way up the hills outside Salt Lake City uh, nearly half a century ago. Um, and that's because each of these objects have over the course of their design and creation been touched and transformed in some way by computer graphics. Um, now, uh, this might be surprising to anyone who's accustomed to thinking of graphics just as visual images that are produced or modified in some way by computation. Um, and likewise, depending on how much you know about computer history, um, I think for most people, computer graphics are a relatively recent uh, invention, sort of emerging at the end of the 20th century as kind of spectacular visual effects and lifelike simulations and film, television, and of course, digital games. But in fact, computer graphics are as old as the modern computer itself. Um, and the development uh, of computer graphics marks uh, a fundamental transformation, not just in the way that we make images, but also in the way that we now kind of mediate our world through the computer. Um, we live in a world that has in many ways been kind of structured by the visual regime of computer graphics and digital images. Um, again, whether that be uh, images captured with a digital camera, um, images designed and rendered using 3D interactive software, um, or even just any image displayed on the pixelated grid of a computer screen, uh, almost all images that we view and make and interact with on a daily basis are in some way, I think, shaped by computation. 
Um, and yet when I first started this project, um, what surprised me was that the history of computer graphics was almost entirely unwritten. Um, so this book, this project uh, began with this premise, both that this is a history that needs to be written um, and that computer graphics are actually much more than the images that we see on our screens. They're actually one of the principal technologies of the sort of age that we are living in. Um, and they really reshaped the way that we understand and relate with um, the material world, the physical world today. And I think to understand what that means, um, we have to kind of uh, produce a material and importantly for me, a kind of local history of computer graphics as it developed in the first half or the second half rather of the 20th century. Um, and so this project is sort of an attempt to take up this task, um, tracing the history of computer graphics in roughly the 30 years prior to its emergence in popular visual culture um, more broadly. So roughly from 1960 to 1990, or, uh, you know, a little bit of wiggle room on, on both sides. Um, and in doing so, it traces, of course, the history of computational images of a variety of sorts, um, but also those technologies that made possible the sort of appearance of those images on these experimental screens at academic and corporate research centers, um, you know, 60 to 70 years ago. Um, and again, to sort of understand and make visible what this means, um, my sort of method, if you will, is to kind of pull apart a rendered image and identify all of the different sort of constitutive parts that uh, make it possible, these kinds of historical objects that make up what I am thinking of as a kind of material history of graphical simulation. Um, and so for this reason, I'm interested not just in sort of how computer graphics developed over the second half of the 20th century, or even who helped sort of develop them through research and innovation, though I will talk about that, and that's very important to the project. Um, but what's particularly interesting to me is sort of what technologies um, were developed and came to define the field as it grew and evolved, and how those technologies really continue uh, to shape the ways that we use and interact with computers today. Um, so again, the book is sort of divided into five chapters and each of them deals with one object in this way. The first chapter um, is about uh, hidden surface algorithms, what's known as the hidden surface problem, um, which was a really challenging problem for early graphics researchers where they had to sort of find a way to algorithmically determine what parts of an image should be visible given a particular perspective projection. Um, so uh, which part of this triangle is in front of or behind this cone uh, is very easy for a photograph or a person to see, but is very difficult for a computer to understand uh, sort of in advance of it being rendered. Um, and so uh, I sort of unpack that throughout uh, uh, an entire chapter of this book. Um, the second chapter is about the frame buffer concept, uh, which is the piece of computer memory that um, stores bitmap information that was developed in the 1970s. And that sort of um, causes the sort of shift from vector graphics to raster graphics in that period of time and makes uh, computer screens interactive in new ways because you can begin to manipulate pixels in order to produce uh, interactive images. Um, the third chapter is about the Utah teapot, which I'm gonna talk about in a bit, so I'm not gonna say much about it uh, right now, um, but it's sort of the most famous object in the history of computer graphics. Um, the fourth chapter is about the object-oriented programming paradigm and its relationship to the history of object simulation in computer graphics. Um, and then the last chapter is about the GPU concept, uh, the graphics processing unit, um, and sort of uh, how it emerges again from this sort of historical moment and has become one of the most sort of dominant technologies in contemporary computer science research, um, which again, I think points to how important graphics is, even though, uh, you know, we pay more attention to its applications in artificial intelligence and data processing, perhaps today. So that's the brief summary of the project. Um, but while most histories of computer science in the US tend to focus on these sort of really prominent research sites, uh, uh, in this early period, um, and you know, even still today, Silicon Valley in particular, um, but also 
uh, what's often described as Boston's Route 128. So the kind of area around Cambridge and Harvard and also the companies that surrounded it that were and still are very important to this industry. Um, this project actually frames the history of computer graphics through a unique but in many ways neglected site in the history of computing. Um, again, in this period when most research was concentrated at these sort of university and corporate research centers on the east and west coasts, uh, at least in the United States, um, the field of computer graphics really develops at these kinds of secondary sites that are mostly left out of the history of computing as it's generally told. Um, and the principal site among these, and the one that I focus on in this book, is the University of Utah, um, which uh, had a graphics program that was founded in 1965 by this gentleman here, Salt Lake City native David C. Evans, um, and was heavily funded by the Department of Defense um, uh, sort of uh, throughout this, this period. Um, uh, which is from roughly 1965 to 1980, during which the faculty and graduates of this program are responsible for developing, um, really inventing most of the major concepts that structure a lot of at least 3D rendered computer graphics um, today, the kind of basic concepts that sort of support everything else. Um, and many of its graduates actually went on to become industry leaders in the field of computing as it sort of commercializes across the 1970s and 80s. Um, and I'll just sort of go through a few of them here, though there are many more that I'd be happy to talk about that are perhaps less well known, but also very important. Um, uh, one of the earliest graduate students of the program is Alan Kay. Um, he was the second PhD student, graduated in 1969, and then went on to work at Xerox Park, uh, which is the Palo Alto Research uh, sort of center for the Xerox Corporation. Uh, and Alan Kay uh, is often um, sort of attributed with having developed or at least popularized the object-oriented programming paradigm and also developed the small talk programming language, um, which was very influential. Uh, he also helped develop some of the first uh, windowed graphical user interfaces, along with, of course, a team of other researchers, um, uh, which, you know, sort of inherits into the screens that we're all looking at right now with their windows, um, uh, the window of Zoom that we're currently looking at. Uh, he also did a lot of work on um, personal computer design and tablet design uh, and um, educational computing as well. Um, and again, graduated from Utah in 69. Um, Nolan Bushnell did not get his PhD from Utah, but got his bachelor's from there and then went on in the early 70s to found Atari. Um, and, you know, based in part, though it's somewhat complicated on having seen things like Space War, that one of the first, uh, or perhaps arguably the first video game or computer game uh, developed at MIT in the early 60s um, while a student at Utah. Uh, John Warnock, who recently passed away, very sadly, um, on the right here, uh, who received his PhD in 74, then went to work at Xerox, and uh, subsequently, in 1980, founded Adobe Systems, co-founded Adobe Systems, um, and is, you know, in some ways responsible for what's often described as the desktop publishing revolution of the 1980s that really shapes almost all printed media that we look at today. Um, and uh, Jim Clark... Uh, seen here on the left, uh, who um, founded Silicon Graphics, which is the company that made almost all of the hardware that was used for things like, um, you know, the special effects in popular Hollywood cinema of the 1980s and 90s that first brought 3D graphics to kind of major mainstream audiences. Um, he also founded Netscape uh, later on, um, which was the first or one of the first web browsers. Um, and then lastly, but of course not least, Ed Catmull, um, who also received his PhD in 74 and then went on to co-found uh, Pixar with Albie Ray Smith uh, in the 1980s. So all these people were at Utah and all of them were at Utah, you know, slightly with the exception perhaps of, of Kay at more or less the same time um, working together, um, primarily doing research into computer graphics, even though some of them went on to do work outside of this field. Um, so if this isn't clear, uh, Utah really is kind of this epicenter of graphical development for the first 15 years of the discipline. And so uh, most of the research for this project comes from the archives and papers of both the computer science program and uh, its founder, David Evans. Um, 
And so to understand the sort of significance of Utah, I want to turn now to a moment in uh, its history, though I'll start at least over a century before the work of these now famous scientists. Um, I'll start here uh, at Camp Douglas, um, or rather Fort Douglas, um, just off the main campus of the University of Utah, um, uh, sits this uh, historical military camp um, founded in 1862 to protect the overland uh, mail route and telegraph lines that were running from Salt Lake City to San Francisco. Um, this site, which is now uh, where the university is located, was sort of strategically chosen just above the city proper um, because the military was concerned about secessionist activity uh, and wanted to kind of keep an eye on the Mormon population of the area um, because they were worried they were going to secede from uh, from the United States. Um, and for nearly a century, it played this really significant historical role in sort of the economic and political stability of this region. But by the 1960s, when my story begins, or when Utah's computer graphics story begins, um, a lot of this uh, land had been um, sort of transferred over to the ownership of the university. And these buildings were sort of delegated often for research projects run by Utah faculty and staff. Um, so this is the context where uh, in late 1968, uh, this abandoned bunker um, in a former military garrison uh, was transformed into the home of one of the very first commercial computer graphics firms uh, in the United States, what's known as the Evans and Sutherland Computer Corporation, or E&S. And, um, and I think this is an evocative image and an evocative sort of site to think about Utah, um, because it exemplifies this early period in the development of computer graphics really well, right? It's really proximate to military funding, um, and uh, yet it's also isolated from the kind of larger field of computer science. Um, it's probably also very apparent from this image that this was really no place to start uh, a computer hardware company. Um, and yet in a lot of ways, this is sort of one of the sites, at least at the beginning of the commercial computer graphics industry uh, as a whole. Um, because of course, there are very few sort of clients for commercial graphics hardware at this time. Um, uh, depending on how much, again, uh, computer history you know, some of this might be redundant, this very brief section here, but it's also important, so I'll, I'll, I'll say it briefly, but the 60s were a really transformative period in the history of computing. Um, of course, at the start of the decade, computing was um, still an extremely expensive and highly limited resource um, that was enabled by largely massive mainframes that were shared by, you know, dozens of researchers working asynchronously. Um, and so while we now associate computing with interactivity primarily, um, in this period, computing was a really fundamentally non-interactive process. Um, tasks had to be programmed in advance onto physical media that you would then submit to a computer operator um, to run calculations. Um, and then you would have to wait hours or even days potentially for those calculations to be batch processed. Um, so these were industrial machines that were uh, made for processing numerical data. In a certain sense, they were more like calculators than they were computers in the way that we talk about them today, um, at least popular computers or personal computers especially. Um, but over the course of the decade, this really begins to change, and that's due largely to the development of a number of key technologies that were designed to sort of interface humans with machines. Um, and the motivation for this shift is uh, sort of both technical and also institutional um, and involves sort of the coordination of public funding um, with large scale research initiatives driven by a really strong vision for what the future of computing might look like. Um, and in the United States, at least, um, the primary player of this transformation was the Department of Defense um, and specifically its Information and Processing Techniques Office or IPTO. Um, which was founded in 1962 and was housed within the Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is ARPA, now known, of course, as DARPA. Um, uh, under the directorship of J.C.R. Licklider, or is this Engelbart, did I mess this up? No, okay. Um, uh, the IPTO put forward a vision for the future of computing uh, as a tool for what uh, Licklider called man-computer symbiosis, um, sort of imagining a future where 
humans and computers would work in collaboration with one another. Um, and they invested really heavily into a number of specific technologies, um, primarily time sharing, uh, network technologies, um, artificial intelligence, though, of course, a very different version of artificial intelligence than the one that we sort of now are in the middle of. And importantly, though often left off of this list, um, computer graphics. Uh, and the IPTO really pushed this vision of the computer as a device that wasn't just about connecting people to one another, um, but rather also connecting people and uh, machines uh, together, allowing for this sort of new form of communication and collaboration with a computer. Um, so this vision was really far from this gatekeeping model that early mainframes um, were structured around. Uh, and this new computer, this imagined future computer, um, uh, was going to be immediately accessible to individuals through, importantly, real-time graphical interaction. Um, so this was the context in which uh, David Evans was approached by then president of the University of Utah, James Fletcher, um, to return to his alma mater uh, in Salt Lake City and found a computer science division within the College of Engineering. Um, Evans at the time was working at Berkeley, actually, again, where, where I am now, um, and had been working for a number of years, over a decade, in fact, in the computing industry in California. Uh, and uh, at Berkeley, he was specifically working on Project Genie, which is an early time sharing uh, sort of application funded also by um, the IPTO. And that's partly the reason that uh, he was able to secure funding subsequently is that he was sort of a known quantity uh, to the Department of Defense. Um, this offer from the university came with the full backing of the institution to sort of shape a program. They said, like, do whatever you want, whatever you think is sort of the future of this field. Um, and so he was appointed the director of computer science and computer operations in 65 and moved from California um, that same year. Um, funds from the university, it is a public university, were somewhat limited, but they were supplemented by a $5 million grant from the IPTO um, that he was able to secure immediately after his hire. Um, and of course, $5 million doesn't sound like a lot now, but you know, it was sort of a, it's a, a sort of nine figure you know, equivalent um, in the hundreds of millions, uh, I believe today. Um, this initial batch of funding was renewed several times, but initially it was meant to last for four years. Um, and the contract was devoted to uh, what was explicitly called graphical man-machine communication, um, which as you might kind of hear, channels Licklider's vision of man-machine or rather uh, symbiosis um, through this lens of uh, graphical interaction really explicitly. Um, the Utah program was uh, quite unconventional in many ways. Um, it recruited graduate students that often no other program would take, uh, Alan Kay being one of them, sort of famously uh, both very brilliant and also a terrible student, um, and fostering a kind of intellectual proving ground where, where students were encouraged to form their own collaborations with faculty and develop these kinds of expert solutions um, that then could be deployed really broadly uh, across uh, a wide range of applications. And I think it's quite telling that despite the kind of uh, often very futurist aspirations that computer graphics has, um, you know, that we don't care about the past, we really want to be doing new things and building the future. Um, a lot of the projects that were produced at Utah during this period remain to this day the de facto solutions for uh, computer graphics research um, and are still widely used by researchers and artists uh, alike. Um, two very small examples are Guro shading and Fong shading, um, which are named after Henri Guro and Bui Tuang Fong, who were both graduate students at Utah in the 70s and are still just default shading options in almost any 3D uh, uh, modeling program. Um, and most people, at least most students, don't know that those names are the names of people and that those people developed those program or those algorithms in uh, the early 1970s. Um, so over this 15 year period, Utah sort of, again, becomes this epicenter for research in the US and attracts faculty from around the world. Um, and again, launches the careers of dozens of researchers who really go on to define a lot of what becomes the commercial computing industry 
uh, in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, and in this sense, Utah, I think, serves as both kind of a test bed for this early research um, and that continues, as I said, to shape a lot of the function of modern computer graphics. Um, but it's also importantly a kind of network of early researchers who uh, kind of distribute that work among all these different research institutions that they move to as uh, computing commercializes in this later period, um, uh, the 1970s and 80s. Um, so the Utah program is, again, both really central to the history of computing, but interestingly, I think for the most part, unless you're a graphics historian or maybe a really a big like SIGGRAPH nerd, um, it generally people don't know that it is it plays such an important role and it wasn't a largely acknowledged part of this history for quite some time. Um, and even in this early period, graphics was considered by a lot of people to be kind of like a frivolous use of computing technology because computing resources were so scarce and so expensive um, that making pictures seemed to a lot of people uh, to be a waste of time. Um, and of course, the technologies that were required to make that happen didn't exist yet. Um, and the machines that they had to work with weren't really powerful enough to um, produce this vision that the IPTO had for what the future of computing would look like. Um, and yet, despite these challenges, from Licklider on, um, these directors really saw graphical interaction as incredibly central to the future of computer science. Um, and so David Evans and others doing this work were given, you know, visionary resources, essentially, um, with no immediate commercial or even defense timeline um, uh, to make that vision sort of happen. Um, and I think the program really benefited from this hands-off approach, um, which by most accounts kind of fostered this culture of research that operated mostly independently of um, a kind of broader consensus on what appropriate computer science research should look like. Um, so by 1968, again, three years into this program, Evans had sort of established it as uh, a key research hub in what ARPA termed uh, centers of excellence, which were um, these sort of distributed uh, centers for targeted research across the country. Um, and he looked to move kind of beyond the university and start establishing a commercial venture. Um, and uh, he had met Sutherland while working on Project Genie at Berkeley many years before. Um, and uh, Sutherland had actually funded when he did a two year stint as IPTO director, that initial $5 million grant to the Utah program. Uh, Sutherland was also probably the most famous computer graphics researcher at this time um, because he developed uh, the Sketchpad CAD program uh, as his dissertation at MIT in 1962, um, which was a very famous uh, and perhaps one of the most influential uh, pieces of software um, uh, ever produced, certainly in computer graphics. Um, and so he was kind of the logical choice, I think, as someone to uh, partner with. And initially, uh, Evans was going to move from Utah to Cambridge, where uh, Sutherland was, to found the venture, again, in proximity to all of this work being done around Route 128. Um, but in part because Dave Evans, as a Mormon, had, uh, I believe, six children, uh, and Ivan only had two, he was convinced to move instead to Salt Lake City, where they founded uh, ENS in an abandoned military bunker in 1968, just off the University of Utah campus. Um, this is that same bunker that I started with um, five years later. Um, the man on the left, again, is David Evans. And the man on the right uh, is uh, Shohei Takada of Hitachi Electronics. Um, I actually found this photo inside a Christmas uh, card that was sent in 1973. Uh, following a visit by Hitachi executives earlier that year um, who wanted to see the work being done in Salt Lake City. Um, and I think if we pair this image with that first image of this bunker on like a snowy winter day, um, I think it really is emblematic of this sort of dual role that Utah plays in the history of computing. Um, at once a sort of isolated and experimental place and yet at the same time, um, somehow also highly connected, quite central and very influential to what would become the future of computer science. Um, uh, and I think ultimately the same thing can be said for computer graphics, because while making pictures with computers 
historically at least has been viewed as kind of peripheral or inessential um, to what we might consider the kind of real work of computer science. Um, if we examine the history of computer graphics, we find that it actually plays a really key role in the growth of the modern computer. Um, and along with it, the kind of transformation of our culture more broadly into um, a computational culture as it has become uh, today. Um, so to understand the role that graphics play, um, I want to turn now finally uh, to a very different kind of object, uh, a teapot, um, specifically this teapot, uh, which is a German Melitta teapot, mid-century German Melitta teapot, um, purchased in 1974 uh, by Sandra Newell uh, at the Zion's Cooperative Mercantile Institution in Salt Lake City. Uh, this is that same teapot, or at least a simulation of that teapot. Um, here it is again on the cover of the ACM Journal Communications uh, in 1987. Um, uh, this image is called the Six Platonic Solids. Um, and again, uh, in the film Toy Story in 1995, um, there are thousands of examples of this particular object that I could show you, um, but sort of collectively, it's known as the Utah teapot. Um, and it's the most famous object in the history of computer graphics. Um, it's a, a stand-in object uh, or a standard object, um, sort of meant to stand in for whatever object might eventually replace it in a given simulation. Um, you kind of throw it in when you need something to test on, basically. It's sort of the lorem ipsum of the computer graphics world. Um, and yet, despite its kind of disposable quality as like a good enough approximation of some kind of uh, material thing, um, it has a history that I think speaks directly to um, this particular early moment in the development of computer graphics, um, both as a technical practice, but also as a kind of culture of production, one that's very geographically specific and culturally specific. Um, Prior to the 1970s, um, the only graphical objects that had been sort of successfully modeled were mostly platonic solids. Um, so things like cones and cubes and other basic shapes. Um, but by the early 70s, uh, researchers began to focus on modeling, scanning, and digitizing objects from the physical world to use in 3D simulations. Um, so one of the earliest attempts at doing this um, was Marcia Sutherland's uh, VW Beetle, which I sort of started this uh, talk with. And in fact, for a brief period of time, uh, the subsequent model that I showed at the beginning of this talk became a sort of test image that people would use around Utah and other places to kind of, uh, you know, test various uh, uh, algorithms for things like shading, lighting, et cetera, um, though ultimately becomes replaced by the teapot fairly quickly by um, the late 1970s. Another uh, early attempt uh, was made by Ed Catmull um, and his colleague Fred Park, uh, who wanted to model parts of the human body for computer animation. Um, Catmull chose his own hand, uh, which was cast in plaster so that polygons could be drawn directly onto its surface, um, which was then digitized using a coordinate measuring machine. Um, and Park, uh, on the other hand, chose to model the human face, um, and rather than a plaster mold, he drew polygons directly onto the face of his wife, uh, Vicky Park, who was then photographed and mapped in a similar manner. Um, so these sequences were then edited into a short film. Um, and in 1976, uh, part of that film, which perhaps some of you have seen, it's it's become famous on the internet uh, it, much more recently. Um, uh, parts of that film were then used uh, in a feature-length movie appearing sort of on screen, as you can see here in Richard Heffron's Future World, which is the sequel or the, yes, the sequel to, to Westworld. Um, uh, and this is often considered sort of the first example of computer graphics in a film, though, as you can see, uh, it is uh, computer graphics on a screen in film. It's not actually a part of the film in the kind of way that compositing works today. Um, so each of these projects that I'm describing uh, has an important technical value in its own right. Um, sort of breaking new ground is the first person to do you know, this or that. Um, but together, they're really indicative of a much larger concern among graphics researchers in this period, which is, of course, standardization. Um, over this period of the early 70s, uh, graphics was trying to standardize the process by which objects were produced, replicated, and digitized. 
Um, but while sort of all objects become alike in that they're all built out of the same sort of primitive elements, points, vectors, polygons, et cetera, um, the teapot really becomes a fixed standard, this sort of object onto which each new algorithm gets applied and tested. Um, so the question that motivated me uh, when trying to write the history of this object is how does this sort of everyday thing become a placeholder for every possible thing? Um, and what does that tell us about computer graphics as a whole? Um, so in 1974, a, a young researcher named Martin Newell um, was looking to model uh, something, again, that would move 3D graphics into this realm of recognizable real world things. Um, and at the time, he was a graduate student completing his dissertation at Utah, um, having immigrated to the U.S. from England three years prior. And so while home today, it's almost uh, comically um, sort of stereotypical, but while home today or home one day for afternoon tea uh, and talking about his research uh, with his wife, Sandra, she suggested that he model the teapot that he had she had recently purchased. Um, uh, and uh, it was kind of a perfect object because it's sort of simple modern shape was an ideal fit for what were then the kind of current challenges to the field of computer graphics. It's sort of reasonably complex, much more so than something like, uh, you know, a sphere or a cone. Um, but it was also elegant, simple, and immediately recognizable. You know what it is when you see it. Um, and so uh, Newell uh, quickly took a rough sketch of the teapot's profile on graph paper, um, kind of capturing the essence of its shape, but not necessarily its precise dimensions. Um, he then uh, processed this data into a series of numbers, which are called patch parameters, um, that could be input into a line drawing program in order to display the teapot as a wireframe model. Um, the final patch array uh, consists of 144 numbers, uh, deceptively simple, technically elegant, and I think most importantly, uh, easy to replicate. Um, the teapot very famously doesn't have a bottom, uh, as you can see here, even though the patch parameters on the previous page added a bottom. Um, but uh, some people are very picky about the fact that the teapot should never have a bottom. Um, there's also a kind of apocryphal story about people memorizing uh, these patch strings and, and being able to input them from memory um, because of how sort of standardized this was, but it seems primarily to be kind of a story people have come to tell and not necessarily true. Um, uh, so over the course of just a few months, this teapot sort of travels from a German factory to a Mormon department store, to a British tea service, to a lab at the University of Utah. Um, but the question still is, how does it become this icon for an entire industry? Um, and its popularity is in many ways, I think a testament to this cultural and technical network that I was describing earlier that the Utah program fostered. Um, while Utah is most famous for its early graphics work, uh, it was also one of the first four sites to be connected to the ARPANET in 1969. Um, which, as many of you are no doubt aware, uh, was the world's first distributed network and the precursor to our modern internet. Um, and so by 1974, that uh, network had expanded tenfold, and Utah students and faculty had access to research sites around the country. Um, this is part of the reason for this center of excellence model that the IPTO um, had uh, initiated. Um, and of course, the ARPANET was also funded through the IPTO. Um, some of the first information to be transferred over the ARPANET was, in fact, graphical data, um, you know, these simple patch strings. Um, and so this is one of the sort of paths, a technical path along which Newell's teapot would travel. Um, but I think more than technical networks, as I said, it's really these sort of human networks of researchers and engineers that when they graduated would move on to other sites and would bring the teapot with them um, and then would apply it, whatever they were working on um, to it. So these patch arrays, these, or rather these uh, texture lighting effects, uh, whatever the algorithm might be. Um, the most influential, I think, person to adopt the teapot was Jim Blinn, who developed some of the first techniques for uh, texture mapping. Um, uh, and uh, other kind of um, uh, visual simulation uh, technologies for for surfaces. Um, uh, most of Blinn, or rather Newell's initial 
uh, renders were quite simple, but Blin kind of saw the teapot as an ideal test object um, because you could you sort of skin it uh, in this way um, to mimic the kind of appearance of ceramics, glaze, etc. Um, Blin then went on to JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of NASA, um, and made a, a number of quite uh, beautiful and uh, ultimately quite famous renders of the teapot that circulated really widely and I think um, produced the popularity that the teapot now has. Um, and over the past 40 years, the teapot has appeared in thousands of research papers and conference panels. Um, it's a common sight uh, in graphics demos. Um, it's included as a primitive in almost all 3D modeling software. Um, and it's often, or at least it has used to be, frequently hidden in the background of um, Pixar films and other kinds of early 3D animation as a kind of Easter egg. Um, so uh, here you can see it in the Windows Pipes screensaver um, from Windows, I think, NT in the early 90s. Um, here it's in the back left in the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror episode from 1995. Um, it's also, I think, perhaps most famously now, uh, the mascot for RenderMan, which is um, Pixar's uh, commercial uh, rendering software. Um, some of this sort of culminates in 2006 when SIGGRAPH um, kind of hosts a commemorative event for the teapot called the Teapot as Object and Icon. And I think this really encapsulates this sort of dual nature of the teapot um, as both like a physical thing and a kind of abstract representation of computer graphics as a whole. Um, and what makes the teapot interesting, I think, again, almost 40 years after it was originally produced, um, is that it's not like other standards, which often test for like the specific functionality of a technology. Um, so if you think about standards for things like television or uh, like the Shirley cards that were used for photography and film, um, rather than testing for one specific thing, uh, the teapot sort of tests for objectness as a whole. Um, uh, it's kind of a basic building block for all of computer graphics, a kind of proxy object um, sort of into which almost anything can be placed. Um, so just as the teapot is kind of a physical object that's shaped uh, by a distinct history and a generic form that we kind of abstract out from it, uh, it also, I think, marks a really important moment in the history of computer graphics where it begins to develop a theory of like what an object is and how it operates. Um, and since I'm almost out of time, I won't talk about this in depth, but um, the teapot was never actually meant to be the thing that it became. It was actually primarily and first used um, as... Uh, one of many objects in Martin Newell's dissertation, um, which was developing a version of essentially object-oriented design for computer graphics, where rather than render each of these chess pawns, for example, as individual uh, objects in memory, uh, you could simply render uh, iterations of a singular uh, sort of class of object um, and only have to store it once and then just surrender it over and over again, which was an incredibly important innovation at that time and part of this important relationship between object-oriented programming and computer graphics that emerges in the 60s and early 70s. Um, so in a sense, every render of the teapot is sort of an instance of Newell's model, just as every graphical object is in some sense an instance of that original Melita teapot. Um, so in this sense, the teapot is actually a lot more than it appears to be. Um, and it's a lot more uh, than the thing that it was designed to simulate. Um, and in a lot of ways, this is the point of this project and the point of this book is to show that computer graphics are a lot more than the simulated images that are sort of disconnected from the materiality of the things that they represent. Um, so while the simulated teapot isn't a complete and accurate simulation of this original Melita teapot, which now lives in the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, um, it's still a deeply material thing that played a really significant role in the history of computer science. Um, and in order to understand that, we can't just like look at an image of the teapot as a render and ask ourselves, is it a good enough approximation uh, of the visual appearance of that thing? Um, or even rely on these popular narratives of uh, graphical realism, fidelity, and this sort of ever improving visual simulation that we generally use to talk about what computer graphics are. Um, instead, if we want to really understand what the teapot is and what graphics are, um, I think we need to kind of dig out these historical objects and practices that made it possible. Um, and this is sort of what I've tried to do uh, with this work. So um, thank you very much for listening.
Thank you very much, uh, Jacob, for that uh, wonderful talk and that history regarding about the uh, computer graphics from uh, Teapot to where we are today. All right, so Mark, um, can you go ahead and uh, address the questions that we have? We have a number of questions. Um, what graphics technology are you excited about? Is web GPU going to be a thing? <laughs> um. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the the thing that I've been looking at now uh, is uh, maybe not something I'm excited about. It's something that interests me, which is uh, is synthetic data training for machine learning, um, which is the use of rendered images for training AI systems, mostly. Uh, which again is as someone who's sort of interested in in uh, the materiality of computer simulation, it's interesting to me that uh, we've sort of begun using uh, rendered images to train uh, often machine vision applications for AI systems, um, such that, uh, you know, um, this idea that uh, we show computers pictures of the world and then they learn about that world uh, becomes very complicated by the fact that we're showing them renders of the world in order to teach them how to navigate a world that is increasingly designed with computers. So uh, um, I've been sort of looking at that, um, which, you know, the timeline for it is, you know, speculatively that, um, you know, by something like 2030, the majority of uh, training data for AI systems will be synthetic, um, you know, the people who say that are probably the people selling it to you. So who knows, but nonetheless, uh, that's sort of what I'm interested in right now. Our next question is, uh, could you comment on the propagation of graphics expertise to, for example, Brigham Young University, including any motivation for those personnel moves? Sort of why, why this location I take to be uh, your question. I think there are a few, because it is to BYU also still now still, and Utah as well, increasingly uh, has sort of returned to uh, uh, graphics research as one of its primary uh, things. There's also uh, Adobe uh, has, has one of its sort of headquarters in Salt Lake as well. Um, and there is this, uh, what's sometimes called Silicon Slopes, uh, which is the sort of tech scene in, um, in Salt Lake. Uh, I mean, I don't, I think some of it is um, like Silicon Valley or like uh, Route 128 uh, about this kind of regional advantage question, um, which is a concept that the historian Annalie Saxenian has sort of used to talk about the importance of, again, Silicon Valley and Route 128 historically. Um, uh, but also, I mean, there's this sort of interesting question that I don't talk about much, which is that many of my historical actors are, are Mormons. Um, and I think it's important that Mormonism is an often uh, sort of future oriented uh, religion that is interested in sort of um, producing in some ways, a kind of utopian imaginary uh, that is not in any way opposed to technology, because we sometimes think about religion and science as being perhaps in conflict with one another, but uh, Mormonism is particularly in, in the, invested in technology. Um, and the role that it plays. Of course, not everyone is Mormon in, in Utah, and I don't want to <laughs> pretend like that is uh, the case, but um, that maybe was an implication of your question. So I'm happy to say that about it. Uh, are there examples of computer graphics history from other countries? Yeah, I mean, certainly my expertise in the sort of archival materials that I, I, I've spent the most time with are in the US. Uh, Germany was also, I'm in Germany right now <laughs> uh, for some other reasons, but uh, uh, Germany was also important uh, to this history and some of the technologies that were developed by Utah people were also developed sort of simultaneously and often in isolation in uh, Germany. Uh, Japan is also important uh, to that history. Um, a lot of the people at Utah came from France, actually. Um, there were a lot of international students, including Henri Gouraud and uh and Bui Tong Fong, who is a Vietnamese um, uh, man, but he uh, came via technical universities in Paris. Um, so, you know, uh, in some ways, the Utah story is also an international story in a certain sense. Uh, is there a major difference in the development of 2D versus 3D graphics? Did things like user interfaces also come from Utah? <laughs> 
Um, that's a great question. And certainly 3D was one of the main focuses of the Utah program specifically. Um, uh, though a lot of the things like frame buffer technology were a sort of fundamental part of um, of graphical user interface uh, developments at, at Park. So um, Dick Shao, uh, who, who developed one of the first frame buffers uh, at Park um, and used it to make the first paint system um, or one of the first paint systems called Super Paint um, that, you know, sort of a proto, like a MS Paint or like a Photoshop-esque thing, which of course is uh, sort of pixel editing and therefore primarily 2D. Um, that was all enabled by the frame buffer concept, which was developed also by Jim uh, Kajia and others at uh, Utah as well. Um, so there is a lot of overlap in some ways uh, in this period of time. Um, but I think that the goal for a lot of this research, this sort of plan in some ways was um, 3D uh, simulation. And I think 2D, we end up, there's other sort of sites that we could talk about, like um, AT&T Bell Labs, for example, um, is an important site for a lot of computer animation and 2D work that happened in the same period. Um, in your book or research, did you connect to the use of digital manipulation and offered Hitchcock's Vertigo 1958 in your research? Uh, uh, the question is specifically wants to know about the title image. The sort of intro to, so that, that Saul Bass intro uh, was inspired by John and James Whitney's computer animation. Uh, and was developed in part with them. Um, though I don't know definitively if it was made entirely with a computer, the Whitney's used, at least initially, um, an analog com uh, computer um, to make these uh, early computer animations that had this sort of arabesque-like swirling effect uh, that then got adopted by um, by Saul Bass for that sequence. Um, uh, so I it, I know but it's not connected directly. Um, the Whitney's uh, are important to graphics history, um, but there isn't a direct connection between the machines that they used and the kind of machines that most of us are using uh, and that I talk about in the book. But that is a very interesting moment for sure. Okay, we have a few last uh, three questions and then we'll get to our ending. Uh, you mentioned the disparity in standards between computer graphics and television. Why do you think broad standardizations caught on in the computer graphics space as opposed to other industries and their more specific standards? I mean, I think that uh, with film and television and these other things, you're testing for a specific um, uh, sort of medium uh, in some ways and you're testing for things like color and these other whereas uh, and there's a sort of standard what, way that they get distributed uh, and there's an infrastructure around them whereas the programmability of computer graphics um, means that the thing you're trying to develop is essentially something that can simulate anything um, uh, and which of course it can't simulate anything but um, that kind of openness means that it's sort of proxy object has to be um open and flexible in that way. Uh, so, um, you know, it's like those things in a certain sense, um, but quite different. I will say that there is wonderful work um, being done uh, on, you know, the way that those standards produce different kinds of bias, um, uh, you know, that gets built into both these technologies like television um, and things like race and color bias, but also that same sort of bias appears in computer graphics research as well. Um, uh, Ted Kim at Yale is doing work on this, for example, um, in computer science. Uh, so, uh, you know, there still are these limitations for sure. Um, is there a more recent updated object which has replaced the teapot as the gold standard for more modern graphic rendering? Sure, I, there are a number of them. Um, the teapot still gets used in part because it's so simple. Um, but in the 90s, there were two different standards at, at Stanford that were developed, the Stanford Bunny and the Stanford Dragon, um, which are both ceramic objects that were 3D scanned, um, which means that they have a much higher polygon count. Um, they'll also have like weird like errors and problems with them. Um, and those do get used uh, quite a bit. There's also a monkey 
face called Suzanne um, that sometimes is seen as a standard, though I don't see it used all that often. Um, and I think for nostalgia's sake, and also because it's sort of like a callback to the history of graphics for like insiders, the teapot still gets used um, quite a bit, uh, even if it isn't maybe testing like the limits of a graphical system anymore. Um, Okay, for our last question, and these have all been great questions. Thanks to the audience for providing them. Can you comment on how the development of computer graphics related to the development of computer-aided design for engineering and architecture? Were they developed separately in parallel, or when and how did their paths cross? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so they were developed in parallel for a great period of time, but of course, rendered graphics and um, design uh, or like computer-aided uh, geometric design um, have very different applications because rendered graphics are supposed to look a certain way. And so you fake a lot of things to make them look that way. Um, whereas CAD has to actually be the way that they things look because you're going to build a building or something with them. Um, so there's a kind of parallel development and Sketchpad and these other kind of early 60s work is often overlapping. Um, and I generally tr say that they split around 1974, um, which is when computer-aided geometric design sort of becomes a distinct field and when a lot of these applications in rendering, like shading and lighting, start to be uh, developed. And those have the goal of uh, looking beautiful, um, but no longer have the goal necessarily of um, modeling the world exactly as it is or modeling geometry exactly as it is. Um, so they still certainly run in parallel, uh, but um, you know some of the applications um, and the afterlives they have in things like film and television, uh, you know, kind of become a separate history um, beginning around the mid 1970s. Great. Thanks for answering all those questions. And by the way, I wanted to mention that about 15 years ago, we had a talk by Larry Yeager, who was uh, was involved in The Last Starfighter, which I understand was the first movie to have actual computer graphics uh, in the scene, rather than, as you pointed out, in Westworld. Yeah, the Westworld one is, I mean, there are always many firsts, but, uh, you know, or people compete for the, the firsts, but... Uh, but yeah, the the Wetzel one is a bit of a cheat because yeah, it's just it's just playing on that screen. But um, that's very interesting, and I didn't know you had been doing this for that long, which is fantastic. I mean, the uh, Chicago chapter of the ACM has been meeting for over fifty years in Chicago. Well, I mean, I I suppose I'm not surprised that you've been around for that long, but I didn't know you had been hosting people in this way, which is very very exciting, and I feel very honored to be a part of that timeline and that and that history. So. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, there's been uh, uh, some questions, comments regarding about professional development hours certificates, PDA certificates, or continuing education credits. So yes, we will provide that um, after this uh, meeting to all the uh, all the participants here, or you can send an email uh, to uh, chair at chicagoacm.org, um, and then uh, we will send that uh, to you. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much, everyone, for attending our last uh, meeting for um, for the year. Uh, and then if you yourself, you know, we're always looking for more speakers uh, for our events. And so if you, you know, have something interesting that you want to say, then um, please reach out to, to us on this. Uh, so you can see the contact there, vice chair at chicagoacm.org or chair at chicagoacm.org. Uh, and also, too, if there's any particular topics or so that you want to see us, you know, to uh, we've done a lot of stuff on data science, you know, machine learning, uh, graphics. We did one on quantum computing. Um, but if there's anything, you know, else or so, you know, that you want to, you know, kind of see, you know, in our ACM Chicago or IEEE Computer Society uh, Chicago, please uh, let us know um, if that's of interest. Uh, and then also, too, as well, like I said, kind of early in the beginning of the uh, meeting or so, uh, we have our videos. So they are at uh, bit.ly slash ACM CHI video. So over there, that will be a link towards the YouTube channel. You can subscribe and then you can get this when it's ready. When we finish doing the editing of this video. Um, and then also as well, then you can see also previous uh, meetings that we've done um, in the past. And also as well, we're also on social media. So you can, if you want to follow us, um, you know, we're on Twitter, uh, at Chicago ACM, 
um, on Facebook as uh, Chicago Chapter of the ACM and also on LinkedIn as Chicago Chapter of the ACM or ACM Chicago. So you can also find us there um, to find out the next uh, meetings as well as Meetup. So we use Meetup as the uh, kind of the, 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 the platform for being able to announce uh, this uh, new event. And also as well, you know, we're always looking for more volunteers. I mean, the success of ACM Chicago is because of our, our volunteers, you know, um, they contribute their time. Uh, we don't get paid for doing this. <laughs> it's something of our own, you know, volunteering effort. So um, if yourself, you know, you want to contribute back to the you know, competing community, uh, to Chicago competing uh, community. Uh, so we need particular people, you know, in writing, planning, uh, videography, audio, and editing, uh, especially, you know, when we have um, events that are you know, in person. Uh, networking and feature speakers and topics, um, and as well to, to kind of spread the word about uh, computing in general to to everybody. So if you're interested, again, um, email us, vice chair at chicagoacm.org or chair at chicagoacm.org. Uh, yeah, so uh, anyway, thank you very much, everyone, for attending our last um, last meeting. We've had a very successful 2023. Um, so... Uh, enjoy the you know the rest of uh, December. Have wonderful holidays. Um, you know, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and then we will uh, announce our next event um, in January. So with that, thank you everyone. Thank you Jacob for your time, uh, for giving this uh, wonderful presentation. Thanks. All right then, thank you everyone, and uh, we'll see you next year. <laughs>